Okay, let's start. Um, so last time we talked about monads on categories, and today we'll just do a whole bunch of examples uh, throughout the day and talk about the Claisley category of a monad. Um, any questions on anything before we start? Okay, let me go over this definition then. So you have any category C, then you can talk about what it means to be a monad on C. Some, and we'll be talking about the category of sets today. And then Bartosz tomorrow, I believe, we'll talk about Haskell, uh, monads in Haskell. And when people use monads in Haskell, and they use things like the do notation, et cetera, they are working in the Claisley category of a monad. And we'll talk about the category theory side of that today, and then he'll talk about uh, the, um, the, how to do it in Haskell tomorrow. So to remind you, a monad on C, but maybe C is a category of sets, if, if you want a specific thing to think about, it has three things, and it satisfies a couple of rules. Um, it comes with a functor from C to C. It comes with a natural transformation from the, identi from like the identity functor on C to T, which means that for any object of T, for any object of C, we'll get a map from that object to T of that object. Um, that's what a natural transformation does. And it comes with, these are reversed here, it comes with something called the join that takes T of T of an object and gives you a map to just T of that object. So remember, natural transformation says, per object here, I'll get a map here between this thing and this thing. Okay, so it's, we have these three structures and we have two laws, a unitality law or two unitality laws and an associativity law that says something like if you have the list A, B, C and you turn it into the list was just the list of lists was just ABC, the singleton ABC list, and then you flatten it, then you get back ABC. And if you take ABC and you turn it into three singletons A, B, C, and then you flatten it, you get back to ABC. That's what these say. And this one says if you have a list of lists of lists and you flatten by getting rid of the middle, uh, the second one or the first one first, it doesn't matter, you'll get the same thing when you double flatten. But there are lots of monads besides the list monad. And that's what we'll talk about next. Oh, first we'll talk about the Claisley category of a monad and then give a menagerie of monads. So another definition. Suppose you have a monad on a category. You have this monad T that comes with a unit or a return and it comes with a multiplication or a join, a monad. The Claisley category On for it. So the Claisley category for that monad is a category. What category is it? So let's call it CT <coughs> has. Um, so the objects of CT are just the objects of C. One way to, so last time Brendan talked about algebras for a monad and there's a category of algebras and one way to define the Claisley category very quickly is to say it's the category of free algebras. And you can make sense of that. Um, we could talk about it afterwards. That's not the way that we'll, we'll talk about it today. The way we'll talk about it today is more like it feels to work with in, in Haskell. So what, what you do in, in the way we'll work with it today is that it's the category that has the exact same objects as C, but a kind of weird morphism. So it's CT morphisms from C1, say C to D, so uh, are going to be um, the set of morphisms from in C from C to T of D. So inside here, I'll write L morphisms like F, C with a line through it today. It's like a special morphism that reminds you that when you look at this, you're supposed to unpack it into really being a morphism from C to T, D in the original category C. So this in CT means this in C. So it's got this strange asymmetry where a morphism, you write it from C to D in this Claisley category, but it unpacks into this like asymmetric thing, C arrow TD. And you might wonder then if that's a morphism, what's the, what's like the identity morphism? I need to give you identities, and I need to give you um, 
maybe I'll try to do it here still. So the identity on C has to be a map from C to C. So in other words, it has to be a map from C to T of C. So if I want to give you an identity, what should I give you? I have a monad T. What should it be? What'd you say? Eta, yeah. So, so IDC is eta. So IDC, um, the identity is the return. Okay, I, IDC is, does that make sense? I need something like this and I've got it because I've got a monad. And I also need, given a map from C to D and a map from D to E, I need, I need um, a map from C to E. So how do I get this? It's basically going to be join, but I'm supposed to unpack this. So what I really have is C to TD, called F. That's the real F. That's the unpacked F. And I have D, oops, I have D to T of E. And how am I going to compose those? Well, I can F map the functor T I can apply T to this morphism and turn it into T of D to, uh, to T of T of E. And now I can compose, and Brendan did this last time, so T of G composed with F is a map from C to T of T of E, and then I can hit this with the join. Um, I don't know if this makes any sense to anyone. Here's join. So I take my C. What happened? That's bad. Okay. I take my C. I run it through F. I compose that with running G after applying T to it. And then I mu out. That's pretty complicated. So you might guess, like, what if, okay, like you just made something up. Is it really a category? And so to check that it's a category, I would have to check that if you go um, identity and then you do F, that that's the same thing as just doing F. So what this says to do is we go from C to T of C by join by eta, and then we go from T of C to T of D. What happened? Oh, T of T of D. And then we come out, and something should commute, but I didn't practice this before I talked, so uh, let's see. So we have C to T, D. So we have T of C to T of T of D. And now I go down to T of D, and I need to check that something goes right. Um, That's eta? That's F? Yep. That's eta again? That's T of eta, yep. So this is this? Yep. And this is naturality of eta. Great, thank you. And yep. Thank you, Paolo. OK, so, so eta is natural. That means when you do f and t of f, this square commutes. OK? F eta being natural means for any morphism, uh, from C to T of D, which we had here. If we apply it before and after doing eta, like F versus T of F, this square commutes. And then the second square commutes because of this condition there. OK. Sorry about that. So, so you can check all of the laws. You can check that this has unital law from the left and unital law from the right, that it satisfies associativity. By, doing, by taking all these axioms and applying them in various ways. OK. So let's talk about a bunch of different monads. Um, so for example, the easiest monad is the identity monad. Take C to C. What is the Claisley category for this monad? Yeah, 
the Claisley category for the identity monad is C. So this is the Claisley category. And what we're writing every time we write C arrow identity of C, we're just writing C, we're just writing like a morphism here from C to T D is just a morphism from C to D in this case, when T is the identity. Okay, so we can recover the original category as the Claisley category of the identity monad. But that's kind of boring, so let's do the, the maybe monad. And let's use, go from set to set. So it takes a set X and returns a set X plus one. In other words, the coproduct of X with one. So what is the return for this monad? What is the eta from X to X plus one? So note, this is the functor. It on objects, it sends X to X plus one. This is confusingly almost of the same, it almost looks the same, right? But this is a function from x to x plus 1. And what does it do to an element of x? Well, it just sends it to the just x. It just sends it to x. Maybe you could call this like, like left x or something. Um, if you were using like either. Okay, and what is the join? It goes from x plus one plus one to x plus one. So what should you do? I think Brendan talked about this last time. And so what you do is to give a map out of a coproduct, you just have to give a map out of each one of the pieces. So I just need to give you a function from, from x to this thing, from one to this thing, and from one to this thing. So I do the function that looks like Identity there, identity there, identity there. Okay. So what is the Claisley category for this monad? What is a map, say, C, if, if X is a set and Y is a set, what is, um, here we have, if X is a set and Y is a set, this means x to identity of y, identity sub c of y, which is the same thing as x to y. In this case, if we have x to y, what does it translate into? X to, x to y plus 1. Thank you. OK, and so what sh how should you interpret a map like that, a function from x to y plus 1? Or what's a way to interpret it? It's like every element of x either gets an element of y or it gets this thing called nothing. And so this is the same thing as a partial function. It looks to be the same as a partial function from x to y. Okay. Some things just evaluate to nothing, other things evaluate to y's. But to check that this is right, we need to check that um, when I say, uh, if I have a map from x to y, and a map from y to z, when I compose them, I should get, if I think of this one as a partial function, and I think of this one as a partial function, when I compose them, it should be some kind of sensible partial function. So why don't you turn to a neighbor and try to understand what this composition will be and whether it feels right with respect to like this, note, this, this interpretation of these guys as partial functions. So talk to someone near you. Anyone have an idea or a way of seeing it? Yeah. So there's a, so x small x maps to small y all the way to the right. If, yeah, if, if there's both, if both arrows. Yeah, yeah. He said um, a little x maps to a little z if kind of both arrows exist. Yeah. So what you do is you have some function from x to y plus a special thing called nothing. So what is one of those? It sends every element to either nothing or to some element. And it's partial because it's, it's, it's acting like a partial function because the things that go to this special element are undefined. They're called undefined in our, in our interpretation. And then they give us, someone gives us a map from y, which is like the stuff above that line, to t of z. And t of z is, uh, so they give us a map that sends everything in, in y to something in t of z. 
Then we extend that, we hit it with T. So we take our map that they gave us and we hit it with T, which just means we take this function as drawn and like send nothing to nothing. And then the last step is to use the join operation here where you just take both of those nothings and turn them into, um, you go straight across, except you send the two nothings to nothing. That's the thing where X goes to itself and the two nothings just go to nothing. And so what you get at the end is that if something in X went to the undefined point, then it just stays there forever, you'll see. If it goes to the undefined point first, it stays there forever. It goes to the unpoint, undefined point second, it stays there forever. But if, it, if somehow it's defined both times, then it goes to where it was defined to go. So here's the join. Um, hopefully that made sense. OK. OK, there's another monad on the power set monad. So this sends a set X to the set of subsets of X. So this is just notation, power set of X, the set of subsets of X. Now that is a functor, so T, T of X, I guess I should call it P, P of X, we're going to make it the set of subsets of X. Um, if I have a function from X to Y, how do I get a function like F map it? How do I get P of F from P of X to P of Y? If you have a subset of X, you have a function from X to Y, how do you get a subset of Y? Yeah. He said, someone said restriction. In other words, it's the set of F of U where U is in U. It's the image of F on U. Okay. So in other words, you have X, you have a function from X to Y um, that sends some stuff some places. And then someone gives you a subset of this one and you return to them a subset of that one. That's how it's a functor, but how is it a monad? To be a monad, we need not only a functor, but we also need a map from X to P of X. That's a natural transformation. In other words, it's a map from X to PX, and it's natural if like someone gave us a map from X to Y, we would get a map from Y to PY, and we'd be able to kind of check something commutes. But that's not the main part that we're interested in right now. Like before you get to this naturality of a natural transformation, the first step is to get the data to understand what this function should be. So for any set X, can you tell me an element of the power set of X? Can you get, sorry, for any element of X, can you give me an element of the power set of X? Yeah, I'm gonna send X, of, I'll call it little a. I'll send it to just the singleton A. That is a subset of X. What about mu taking the power set of the power set of X to the power set of X? So if someone gives us a set of sets, a, su a subset of all the possible subsets of X. Like X has ABC and they give us like four different subsets of ABC. How do we give them back one subset of ABC? We could give them back the empty set no matter what they gave us. That's not very good. We could take the intersection. That's a good idea, but it doesn't work. Perfect. It doesn't work in the sense that you won't get some of these laws working correctly. So um, what you do is you, mu of x is the union. So you, mu of x on like, on some u is the union over all u and u of u, of little u. <laughs> B. 
So V is a set of sets. It's a set of subsets of X. For every subset of it, we union all those subsets together. So let's, let's try this. Let's say X is 1, 2, 3, and they give, us an L, they give us the subset 1, empty set, and 1, 2. This is an element of the power set of the power set of X. It's a set of subsets of X. And what we do to it when we take mu is we just take the union over all three of these things of what they are. So um, this is sent to the union of one empty set and one two. And then you can check that these two laws hold that if you add like a subset of subsets of subsets and you kind of unioned and then unioned to be the same as unioning the other way and unioning the other way, um, or that if you take a singleton and then you, if you take any set and you turn it into the singleton subset of just that one subset, so you have a subset, one, two, you get the subset of subsets, just one, two, and then you union it, you get one, two back, stuff like that. Okay, so what is the Claisley category for the power set monad? Yep. So about the about eta. Yeah. I'm wondering so there X is a set and A is an element of that set? Yep. Um so what happens if like if X is, has like two elements, like A and B? Then eta of A would be the set A and eta of B would be the set B. Oh the question was what if X has two elements just A and B, what would eta do? Well it send each element, A and B to the set consisting of just that element A, or just B. Well, what happens with like, the set of A, B? So that is not in X. But you would find, so the question now was, what about the subset A, B? Well, that's not an element of X, that's a subset of X. So that would be appearing here, or here. And what these laws say, if you turn that into two singletons, set A and set B, so you took set A, B, one thing you could do to it is go like this. Another thing you could do to it is go like this. So you could either turn it into a set of just A and just B or the set AB. And then you could flatten both of those. And no matter which way you did it, you would get AB back. OK. But I'm going to erase what I just wrote. Which is why intersection wouldn't work. Yay. OK, thank you. Yeah. So uh, I just use this law to like, I just checked this law in the case of our monad. OK. Oh, so I, the question before someone else's question was, uh, what is the Claisley category? of the power set monad. For every monad, you get a Claisley category. It's a brand new category, kind of related to the original category, but with this monad in there somehow. And when I say, what is it? Well, you could just say, it's that. It's this. And that is correct. But then you could say, how could we interpret it? Like, what's this more standard way of interpreting this category? So um, does anyone have an idea? So the objects are the same as before. We're, we're in this on set. So the objects are set, are sets. And the morphisms from x to y mean functions from x to the power set of y. So for every element of x, we don't just get an element of y. We get like a non-deterministic element of y. We get a whole set of possible y's. One way you can write power set of y is 2 to the y. It's a set of functions from y to 2. Or in Haskell, maybe y arrow 2. So if I think of it that way, that's the same thing as, and a lot of times people write 2 like an equal sign. A thing of this form is, can be equivalently thought of as a map from x times y to 2. Well, it's a map from x to 2 to the y. But that's the same thing as a map from x times y to 2. And that's the same thing as a subset of x times y. So 
So a map from x to the power set of y is the same thing as a relation, a subset of x times y. How do you see the difference? So this is things like less than. If x and y are numbers, less than is a, map, is a relation on that. Or if x is people and y is dogs, this could be like owner, the set of, like, the set of person comma dog pairs where the person is called the owner of the dog. Um, uh, how does this relate to this? A map like this owner relation, for some reason I'm like stuck on this owner as that we own the dog, like now I'm like, no, we don't own the dog. Okay, but anyway, this owner relation uh, says for any person you would get the set of dogs that they own. And that's how these two things relate. So many people, I would go to the empty set of dogs and some other people would go to like lots of dogs. Okay, so that's what the Kleisley category is. We get these relations, and if I had a relation from x to y, so I get a, I have every x gets a set of y's, and every y gets a set of z's, then I get from every x to a set of z's, and it just does this thing where it unions up. You take all the dogs I own, and you take all the fire hydrants they like, and you get them out from me, like people, to fire hydrants. That just takes the union of all the fire hydrants of all the dogs that they like, they own. Um, okay. okay, so that's that. Okay, we have two different, we have lots of different monads now. And there is another important monad. And if you like this monad, you should talk to Paolo and back. So this is called the probability distribution monad. And not all of these can you do in Haskell. You can, do all, you can work with any monad you want in things like, in like a, a dependently typed language like Agda or, or Idris, but you can't in Haskell because, um, because, well, it's more computable, so it's better for many things. It's more real world, but you can't do everything in it. Okay, so the probability distribution monad on set. Um, what's that? This is, something this is something you cannot do as far as I know or at least I don't know if there's a way to do this in Haskell. I don't see how you would do it. Um, there are probably people who have like implementations of things close to this, but okay. So what does it do? It takes a set X to the set of, and we really should be doing this on measurable spaces instead of sets, but we're gonna like do a thing that works on sets. So what is, I need a function, I need a functor from set to set. That's the first part of a monad. And so what does it do? It'll be the set of all p taking x to the interval 0, 1, the numbers between 0, 1, such that 1 is the sum over, oops, 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 such that, first of all, um, p of x, p of little x is 0 for all but finitely many x. That's the first condition which you really don't want to have. It's not a very good condition. And if you didn't want that condition, you would need to use measurable spaces instead of sets. So first of all, this thing is going to be mainly 0. But more importantly, or more like interestingly, the set of things where it's not 0 um, add up to 1. So for example, if x equals 1 to abc, then inside of uh, prob, or I'll call it dist, um, inside of dist of x are all possible probability distributions on three things, which are basically, th it's called the two simplex, but this includes things like, um, like a, b, c, 0 0.7, 0 0.3, 0 is in there, and On what? Finset. I could define it on finset instead of on set. Yeah. Oh, no. Nope, I could not do it on finset. Because what you get is an infinite set out. When I apply the monad, I need to land back in that category. So when I apply, yeah, so it wouldn't work. Thanks, Brendan. Um, so there is a probability distribution. It takes a to 0.7, b to 0.3, and c to 0, or whatever, a to a to 0.5, and b to 0.5, 0.25 and c to 0.5, sorry, c to 0.25. These are two different elements of dist x. 
Okay. And that is a monad. Can you tell me what the return is, the unit? So I need a function from x to zero to probability distributions on x. This is a lot like the previous one with the power set, except one difference is that the subset needs to be finite. Oh, I don't want to do that actually. One thing is that power, the subset needs to be finite, and the other thing is that the, it like instead of just a subset, it's a, a subset together with like for every element of that subset, a number, and those numbers add to one. But so it sounds a little bit different, but the return and the join are pretty similar. So, any guesses on the return? Yeah, an impulse function, um, dist x. It sends little x to um, p, uh, where p of little x, p of a, equals 1 if a is x and 0 if a is not x. So it's like you have the set x, and you get the probability distribution that's just like 1. For every element of x, you get a distribution. It's 0 everywhere except on that x and where it's 1. OK, and then if I have a map from x to dist of y, and a map from y to dist of z, I need a map from x to dist of z. That's Claisley composition. So I have a map from x, and every element of x gets a distribu probability distribution on y. Every element of y gets a probability distribution on z. And so what I do is I take, I take that element of x, I take all the things that it's sent to, like 0.5y1 and 0.5y2, and for each of them, I get a probability distribution on z. And then I add them up with those weights. So it's like weighted sum or integrate. You integrate the probability distribution. Um, you get a distribution of distributions that you then just integrate. You marginalize those lines. Yeah. OK. So the Claisley category of this monad is called Stoke. for like stochastic maps. The category of sets and stochastic maps or measurable spaces and stochastic maps or various other um, ways of working with this sort of thing. And so there's a lot of work right now in applied category theory on various ways of understanding probability theory just in terms of its categorical uh, axioms, say. Instead of thinking about about all the measure theory as it is, we think about like what axioms they satisfy from the point of view of like commutative diagrams or string diagrams. And, um, and that's an active area of research right now that you could talk to Paolo about. Okay, let's see, 41. Hmm. Okay. I was gonna talk about the writer monad. Brendan talked about it last time. Um, for any monoid M, with a unit and a star, you get a writer monad that sends x to x times m. This is called writer. And the unit is basically x to x comma unit, and the join is basically, you're gonna get two m's, you need to turn them into one m, and um, you use the times. What, I know that's a little bit fast, but, um, what this ends up doing, a map from x to, to y in the Claisley category would be a regular old map in Haskell or whatever from x to y that also not only gives you a y, but also gives you this m, an element of m. If m is the set of strings or something like that, the monoid of strings, then you always just keep accumulating these m's, these strings. And the times of concatenating will make your kind of log of strings continually grow. You'll just keep writing a log, basically. So you can think of this as writing a log. Morphisms in this Claisley category. Um, okay, let's do this 
the state monad. So there's tons and tons of monads on the category of sets. Um, for any monoid, you get a monad, for example. Um, for any set S, um, we have a, f a monad, state monad. Monad consists of three things, a functor and two natural transformations. So what is the state monad, state sub S, from X, what does it do? to x. Well, it returns x times s to the s. Functions from s to x times s, which is a little bit weird, except this one comes directly from the curry from currying. Comes from currying. I don't have time to talk about this, um, but we can talk about it afterwards. There's just too much for this course to get everything in. But basically, for every adjunction, you get a monad. And one thing we talked about before was like there's this, there's this adjunction from x times s to y versus x times y to the s. This is currying and uncurrying. And when you take an adjunction, you can always turn it into a monad in a way we have not talked about. And when you do it, you get this monad. It's kind of like going round trip. So this thing is kind, looks kind of complex, but it's called the state monad. So what's going on? Why is it, what, is, what does it have to do with states? Well, it has to do with states in the sense of what a Claisley map is. A Claisley arrow um, by the way, I haven't told you what the monad is, and I probably won't, because I don't want to tell you the return and the, and the join. I could tell you the return and the join. Who votes to hear about the return and the join? Everyone wants to see the return and the join. <laughs> okay. So I need a map from x to x times s to the s for join, or for return. Well, to give a map like this, I could curry it, and it's the same thing as giving a map like this, right? Because if I put x for x and, uh, what do I put? x times s for y, then I get x times s, x times s, x state of x. And so to get the map from x to state of x, I just need to use this, and I use the identity. So given the identity here, I get something here, and I call it eta. And what does it look like? It says, given an x, so eta, or return, is supposed to give a map from x to s arrow x times s. And this is just curry of id, or uncurry of id. It sends return of x uh, s equals x s. OK. And join is a little more difficult. You would say x times s to the s times s to the s to x times s to the s. And this is just a matter of kind of following your nose. You guys still vote to see this? I'm getting, yes? OK. Um, OK, let's see if we can. I don't know if it's interesting, but. So we want join of some f. So we, OK, so we need a map join that takes s arrow x times s, s arrow, s arrow x times s times s. Uh, this is going to hurt. Um, and returns s to x times s. And so we take this function, so join of this f here. We apply it to s by, yeah, I don't know if I can do this here. Um, basically, you follow your nose through this thing, and you get something out, and you, it just works. <laughs> yeah. I shouldn't volunteer to do things that I don't practice. Um, yeah, so 
Let me say a better way to think of it, though, and that is through the Claisley maps. So if you want to map from x to y times s to the s, it's sufficient. This is a Claisley map from x to y, right? It's sufficient to give a map from x times s to y times s. And this is the right way to think about morphisms in, in the Claisley category. A morphism in the Claisley category from x to y, you write it as though it's just a map from x to y, but what it's secretly doing is keeping track of state. It says a map from x to y is secretly turning into, in the Claisley category, a map from x to y times s to the s, meaning it's a map from x times s to y times s. So if you had an x and a state that you were keeping track of, and a y and a state that you were keeping track of, you would be able to like, take your x and s and get a new state. And the Claisley composition is going to use this crazy thing that I haven't told you what it is, that we will do after class when we have time, um, when, when I have space to kind of process it. But uh, what's going to happen is you have a map from x to y and a map from y to z. And this one turns into a map from x times s to y times s under the hood. And this one turns into a map from y times s to z times s under the hood. And when you trace out what this crazy thing is doing, which looks completely nuts, it's actually just composing these two maps. So it's not nuts at all. It's just, this is handling in some very like convoluted way. No, no, it's just applying a function and then applying the function again. Like this one is not true. Can you tell me what it is? Yeah, it's kind of how you apply f to the s. And you get the player of a new function and then s. So you said this is the answer? This is, huh? is this? That, that's a player. That's a player. That's a player. I don't know what you're saying. Oh, okay. And you're going to apply them again. If you don't yeah. have the syntax uh, on the blackboard. Yeah. 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 So if you curry that once, so that it becomes that whole thing times s to x times s, right? Mm -hmm. Then you get. Curry this over here. Yeah. And so you have an s and then something and a function that takes an s. Yep. You combine that, you get the thing in the middle, uh, the thing in the parentheses. And once again, you have an s and a function that takes s. Oh, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. So the idea is, I want this function. I curry this s over here, and now I have an s and this th and this thing. This thing takes an s and returns that. So I have the s. I plug it in here, and I get this. Now I have again something of this form. I take the s that I have here. I plug it in there, and I get the x times s that I needed. Okay. So it's not that convoluted, but it's like a lot of like steps that you kind of have to watch. What it ends up doing when you, un when you kind of curry things right and look in the Claisley category is just straight up composition of like state-based morphisms that take an x as written, but also take an internal state not written and return a y in a new state. Okay. Um, yeah. What else? So another, I guess I was going to talk about applicatives and, la and laxmanoidal functors, but there isn't too much time. So why don't I, why don't you discuss with a neighbor what we've talked about and any confusion you have, and I'll come around and we'll just end here um, on that.